the escalatory cycle that we're on right now. Now, the basic point is this. We are uh, in a war with Russia. Uh, it is a proxy war in that it's mostly Ukrainians uh, that are fighting uh, on the ground, though there are some foreign forces also. Uh, we don't know exactly who, but the U.S. is involved in the military intelligence, the armaments flows, the logistics, uh, and the strategy. Uh, so this is a proxy war. And we have said that uh, the war is to defeat Putin. And on the other side, what I know is that Putin and Russia, to the best of my knowledge, view this war also in existential terms. Let me just put it that way at the start, which means they do not plan to lose this war. The U.S. seems to think that, well, if you bloody Russia's nose enough, they'll just go home. And the U.S. has gone home from wars like Vietnam and Afghanistan. But what the U.S. doesn't understand is that from Russia's perspective, what's happening in Ukraine is core to Russia's national security. It's not just a, a lark or an ancillary move or a tactical move. Russia, Russian leaders, I should say, view this war in stark security terms. Right or wrong, what that means is you have two sides that say, we are not going to lose this war. Both sides are nuclear superpowers. Right. And I think that this is the core reality, which is that I do not want to test the proposition that Russia will be defeated without using nuclear weapons. I do not like the rhetoric that we have, oh, we won't be, uh, we, we won't act out of fear. Uh, it's a bluff and so forth. Well, it's not a bluff, uh, Russia's sense of its security threat that it's facing right now. That's not a bluff. That's real. The people in charge in our country have little deep understanding of the Russian perspective. I know that because I've, I've been around this for 32 years yeah. and the U.S. Uh, just pushes its way in uh, and does what it wants and declares the other side crazy or whatever, but crazy, but super rational that it's not going to use nuclear weapons. And it's, <laughs> it just doesn't add up, basically. It doesn't. Now, when you, when you look at the, the history of this, this is, a, uh, this is a war that didn't start on February 24th. 2022. It was not an unprovoked war that suddenly started on February of, of this year. In fact, the fighting's been going on for eight years because uh, the fighting started in 2014. But even that fighting had very stark antecedents. And I take the story back already 32 years ago. You know, at the end of the Soviet Union, and I happened to be around uh, at the time as a uh, one, one of the uh, one 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 of the uh, advisors closest to the action, I would say, right. uh, in Eastern Europe, and advising uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's economic team and then Boris Yeltsin's economic team. I saw a lot. The United States said to Gorbachev, who offered, who said, I. I want to end the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet military alliance, said, we will not take advantage of that if the Soviet Union uh, ends the Warsaw Pact, we will not extend NATO to replace the Warsaw Pact. This was extremely clear. For, this for, was people, for people who don't know, what, what is the Warsaw Pact and why? The was Warsaw it important? Pact was the Soviet NATO, if you right. want to put it that way. Right. That was a military alliance of states that were under Soviet control in Central and Eastern Europe. And their militaries were tied to the Soviet Union. And the two sides, the U.S. led alliance NATO and the Soviet led alliance, the Warsaw Pact, faced down each other's uh, uh, tank uh, uh, turrets uh, and, and uh, right. uh, gun sights and, and actually 
came face to face in in uh, tank confrontations in Berlin in 1962, uh, one of the events that nearly led us, uh, or end of 61, I guess, uh, that led us to the brink of nuclear war. And Gorbachev, as a man of peace who wanted to reunify Europe, he didn't want to end the Soviet Union, but he wanted to reunify Europe and reform the Soviet Union, knew that his uh, part, of his side was in crisis and needed reform, but it, it wasn't uh, uh, that uh, they didn't have options, but Gorbachev's option was, let's make peace. Right. Uh, we will stay, step down from the military alliance, and NATO said, we too, we won't extend. Now, the long and the short of it is uh, the U.S. cheated, as usual, uh, because uh, we typically cheat because we are powerful, uh, and power brings impunity. Right. You do what you want. No one's going to stop us from that. And literally in the White House in 1992, uh, the neoconservatives uh, led by Cheney and Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld and others uh, were saying, oh, my God, now we don't have an enemy. Now we are the unipolar power. We're the sole superpower in the world. We do what we want. And they already started to plan a number of wars that were going to end the regimes that had sided with the Soviet Union and so forth. Well, they didn't recognize there was a, another world possible now. There was Russia that wanted normal relations. There was Gorbachev before Yeltsin that wanted normal relations. I was there. I know what they wanted. They wanted normalcy. They wanted peace. But the U.S. got the idea, okay, now it's time for us to extend NATO. Now, the first expansion was to Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic, Central Europe, right. not on Russia's border, in 1999 provocative against what we had promised, but not a dire direct threat to Russia. Russia complained, but it wasn't up against Russia. Then came NATO bombing of Serbia, close ally of Russia in 1999, bombing Belgrade for several weeks. Now that kind of uh, miffed uh, this, the Russian leadership saying, yeah, you're supposed to be a defensive alliance. You're bombing our ally. Then came George W. Bush and uh, his intention to extend NATO basically on an unlimited scale in the region. So he expanded NATO to seven countries, uh, the three Baltic states right up against Russia's border now. Two, Balt uh, two uh, Black Sea states, uh, Romania and Bulgaria, and Slovenia and Slovakia, seven during uh, his uh, eight-year period. But the main uh, bombshell, if I could call it that, came in 2008 at the Bucharest NATO summit when the United States insisted that NATO get ready for enlargement to Ukraine and to Georgia. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at a map, you can see that we are then, first of all, right up against Russia's border yes, with the U.S. alliance. And Georgia, my God, look at a map. That is not a North Atlantic state. Remember, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The idea clearly was to surround Russia in the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. Why the Black Sea? Because that's where Russia's naval fleet is. Right. And even... Uh, U.S. strategists wrote very clearly that uh, if Russia is bottled up, if the U.S. controls essentially Ukraine, then Russia ceases to be a major power. The U.S. gains a great advantage uh, in geopolitics and in, in its role in Eurasia. So we played out that game, we thought, with yeah. uh, NATO expansion. In 2013, things went red hot because Russia had a neighbor in Ukraine, a president at the time, Viktor Yanukovych, who was a pro-Russian politician uh, and uh, led Ukraine to declare neutrality in 2010. And this calmed down things because Ukraine itself said, no, thank you, we don't want NATO. Uh, we want to be neutral. We don't want to get uh, these two superpowers fighting over us. Right. But then the United States clearly played a role in the overthrow of Yanukovych 
at the end of 2013 and early 2014. I saw that with my own eyes, actually, because after Yanukovych was overthrown, I was asked to go to uh, Kiev to talk with the new government about the economic crisis, and I went. And when I was there, I was shown around by uh, NGOs of the U.S. explaining the direct role that they had played in the Maidan overthrow of Yanukovych. And we also caught Victoria Nuland, who's currently our Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, on the phone planning the post-Yanukovych government in Kiev. Mm -hmm. oh, but don't listen to those tapes. Uh, let's keep focus. Exactly. Uh, you know? Yeah, uh, so don't, we don't told, look at how we got here. <laughs> yes, we, we were told we had nothing to do with that. This right. was uh, uh, just a public insurrection. Well, at that point, Russia, from that moment on, we've been at war, basically, because yeah. uh, Russia said the U.S. is pushing yeah. absolutely uh, and is aiming to corner us. That's the Russian perception. You may say exaggerated or not. I think there's a, a lot in that perception, frankly. But since the overthrow of Yanukovych, Russia has viewed this issue of NATO enlargement as a dire threat. Now, fast forward to 2021. But with one uh, sentence, we funded massively the Ukrainian army between 2014 and 2021. That's why it's fighting right now. We poured in billions and billions of dollars. Russia watched that, of course, saying, my God, this is becoming an American-based uh, army, uh, effectively, American hardware. Then came Biden. I thought, OK, maybe, maybe something will cool off. Quite the contrary. Biden just played the deep state game. Uh, I don't know who's really calling the shots, frankly, but Biden said, basically, we're in a struggle with Russia. And three times in 2021, the United States at the highest levels reaffirmed that Ukraine would be a member of NATO. Uh, and this was at the 2021 NATO meeting and in a State Department strategic document with Ukraine and in a Defense Department strategic document with Ukraine. Well, at the end of 2021, Biden, uh, Putin said, look, this is completely uh, unacceptable for our security interests. And he put down uh, demands, if you could call it that, that NATO must stop enlarging and we need to negotiate over this. I, at that point, called the White House and I said, for heaven's sake, negotiate. This is real. And NATO enlargement isn't even desirable for Ukraine. It's not desirable for us. We would never tolerate such a situation, say, Mexico deciding, oh, we want a military alliance with China. Right. And Washington says, no problem, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't even imagine because we don't even attempt for an iota to put ourselves in the other position to understand what this means. That's why we get so many things wrong, because we don't think we have to understand anything. We have exactly. to make up their narrative and our narrative because we're the United States of America. We're so powerful. So the, the upshot of it was Biden said we will never negotiate over Ukraine's right to join NATO. That's never going to be on the table. They call it the open door policy as if the U.S. has the right to form military alliances anywhere, irrespective of the security implications for other countries and our in the own. neighborhood, we, which we would <laughs> never accept. We have something called the Monroe Doctrine, right. which told Europe, don't even dream of doing what we do routinely. Right. Well, the war came, and then what I said at the beginning, we are now in, we're in an extraordinarily dangerous moment because Russia views this war as core to its security. The United States, because the Ukrainians are fighting anyway, so it's not on our ground, says we're just going to continue to fight to defeat Putin. We don't even hide it. Uh, in fact, I think we go out of our way not to hide it. Biden saying this man cannot remain in power the U.S. Uh, Secretary of Defense saying our goal is to weaken Russia. Zelensky, uh, just about every day, not uh, even talking about Ukraine's interests, but mocking Russia, mocking Russia. 
So the idea is humiliation. They think uh, that, uh, you know, perhaps uh, uh, this will lead to Putin's overthrow. After all, you know, Yanukovych was overthrown. I don't know what dreams or gambles or whatever they're playing, but boy, are they playing with fire. Yeah. And they're playing with fire on our heads. And I profoundly resent it. And I'm shocked by the complete lack of any debate in the U.S. Congress on this. You know a lot more about that than I do. But I just cannot believe that we don't have a full-fledged debate about how dangerous this situation is. And one thing I'd I'd like to read, uh, Tulsi, you know how much I admire President Kennedy for not having blown up the world 60 years ago in the Cuban Missile Crisis when all his advisors said bomb and they also had everything wrong as usual. They said, well, the, the missiles in Cuba aren't, aren't ready, but they were ready. And we would have had a nuclear war. But Kennedy sussed it out properly and understood that we needed compromise. We needed diplomacy. We needed to pe- peace. So he removed uh, American missiles from Turkey. Uh, Khrushchev removed the Soviet missiles from uh, Cuba. And afterwards, the two leaders exchanged letters saying, my God, this world's crazy. We need to pull back from the brink. And the following year, they signed the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Right. And in the lead up to that treaty, Kennedy made the greatest speech of an American president in modern history. And I urge everybody to get online June 10, 1963, the American commencement speech, also known as his peace speech, because he lays out how you preserve the peace. But one thing that he said, and I want to read it because I think it's, it's so striking. He said in this speech, above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world. Listen to what he's saying. Do not confront a nuclear adversary with the choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. I can't think of a closer description to what we are actually doing right now yeah. than that. It yeah. is the precise description of what is actually underway in the United States. Uh, we are aiming to humiliate this person and we're doing it and we are risking nuclear war. And then we're told by our leaders, and I don't know, I don't know what they're thinking, honestly. I don't have a clue as to what's really in their minds. But they're telling us, don't worry about it. Exactly. My my advice is worry. (laughs) Worry. Completely. Call your congressman, say, this is crazy. Stop this. Yeah. I think, I think, I mean, gosh, everything that you're saying is obviously so directly on point as far as how we, how we got to this position and how completely our leaders are absolutely failing us. Um, it seems as though they have a death wish to the world in the way in which, you know, they're talking about, oh, the use of tactical uh, nuclear weapons and strategic nuclear weapons as though a nuclear war can possibly be contained or limited and can be won. Tulsi, Forg- it's a, it, just, just a, sorry yeah. to interrupt. But, no, no, no. You know, you, you, you read in their newspaper articles, will Putin use uh, nuclear weapons? What is his arsenal? Let's have a look. Exactly. As if this is the most normal thing in the world. Yes. Yes. And and as though as though like okay, so he's got, you know, what is it, over 6,000 nuclear warheads. We've got over 5,000 as though like, oh, that's going to make a difference than if he had 2,000 because if he had fewer and launched fewer nuclear weapons that that would somehow limit the impact of of truly the nuclear holocaust that that one nuclear attack would launch, not not just in one country in Europe, but but on the world, sparking World War III. And I think I think the fact that politicians are not talking about this, 
the mainstream media is certainly not talking about it, except in the in, in a nonchalant way as though, hey, yeah, this is no big deal. Let's just have a conversation about it. But like you said, it should raise a huge waving red flag of concern to everybody at home that there is no debate on this in Congress. And that if anybody tries to bring this up, they immediately are labeled as you and I have been and continue to be as, oh, well, you're just a, Pu uh, a Putin puppet. You are an apologist for this terrible dictator. You are this all of this name calling and smearing without ever actually just going to the substance of the conversation. We can have exactly. a debate on the role of NATO and whether it should be enlarged or not or Russia's intent or this and that. But the fact that there is no credible debate on the fact that we are on the brink of nuclear war because of the decisions that American leaders and leaders in NATO have made and continue to make, refusing to choose a path towards, a path towards peace and diplomacy, refusing to recognize the threat to the world, we are in this position because of that. And I think it, it goes to um, you know this recent news of how our, our federal uh, Department of Health and Human Services is now purchasing drugs to use in a radiological and nuclear emergency for the American people as though like, yeah, no big deal. We'll give you a couple of pills or inject you with some drugs so that you can withstand a nuclear attack. Uh, I'm sure you saw the, the PSA that New York City put out saying, hey, uh, if there is a nuclear attack, get inside, stay inside, and stay tuned. Uh, we saw, re you know, back in, in our uh, nuclear missile at uh, attack scare that we had in Hawaii, you know, everybody got the text message a couple of years ago saying, hey, missile incoming, seek shelter immediately. This is not a drill. But like everyone in Hawaii realized immediately when we thought, hey, we've got 15 minutes to live, there is no shelter. There's no place to go. Of course. It's so, all of this is so cruel, so macabre, so surrealistic, so stupid, uh, so phony. Uh, it, we used to have in my childhood the duck and cover. Get under your desk. Exactly. That, that'll that save you. Right. Uh, you know, it is hard to imagine, uh, hard to understand what anyone is thinking right now in the leadership That's in Washington. That's exactly what I'm if, wondering. If they, if they are thinking at all, I, I try to reach out because I know a number of these people, they're not interested. They don't want to hear it. They're not talking. They are provoking. There are big mysteries, by the way, that as everything, because everything is a lie and everything is classified. But in mid-March, we got reports that from the Turkish mediators, that Russia and Ukraine were close to an agreement. And both the Ukrainian and the Russian negotiators confirmed that. And they exchanged papers. And then you hear from the U.S., ah, oh, we don't think these are going anywhere. Right. These negotiations aren't going anywhere. And then Biden flew to Brussels to meet with the other NATO leaders. And he said, this is going to be a long war. He didn't say this is promising news. He said this is going to be a long war. Then he went to Warsaw and he said that man cannot stay in power. Yeah. And then Lloyd Austin said uh, we're weakening Russia. You see it has all of the hallmarks of us torpedoing the negotiations. Can I prove it? No, because they don't tell us anything and everything is a lie. But what I can see is that the United States government has never in this whole crisis, stood up and said, we want to see effective negotiations and we support them. We thank Turkey for being a, a mediator. We call on both sides to reach an agreement. Yeah. We are dead set against that because these neocons have had this fantasy world for 30 years that this is the U.S. world and that this is the unipolar world. And if we want to expand NATO, we're going to expand NATO and no one's going to stop us nuclear threats or not. And that's where we are right now. So so you're saying this go this goes back 30 years. I want to go back to your description of what happened in kind of that immediate post-Soviet era. The Warsaw Pact was dissolved. Was there ever a debate or conversation at that time saying, okay, if the Warsaw Pact is resolved, then what purpose is there for NATO to exist in the first place? If, if NATO existed as a counterbalance towards uh, the Soviet threat or pressure, 
well, if the Warsaw Pact is gone, does NATO have a purpose? And if NATO does exist, was Russia ever invited to join? So very interesting. There were, of course, people who had that thought and some senior people and some very clever people. Bill Perry, who was our defense secretary yeah. under Clinton. And Perry looked for ways for NATO to reach out to really try to bring Russia into a trustful relationship so this becomes a security alliance, not a confrontational alliance. And he describes in his memoirs how much progress he made and the personal relations he forged with senior Russian officials and the institutional progress. Then he says, then he started hearing, my word, in the State Department, they're pushing for NATO enlargement. Hmm. And he starts asking around, what is this? And it's Madeleine Albright and, uh, and uh, Holbrook, Richard Holbrook. And he says, this is a terrible idea. We're just at a fragile stage right now where we're building trust, building relations. Why would you start to do this? And he doesn't understand that it's a done deal because he's been played bureaucratically. And he goes to see Clinton and Clinton says, yes, I'm considering and so on. And, and then Clinton decides, OK, we're going to expand NATO because Clinton, I think, regarded this in his uh, local political terms as a good move for the 1996 elections. Maybe who knows? You mm. never know because it's Jeez. so flaky, this kind of thing. And Perry writes in his memoirs, I debated, should I resign at that moment? You know, because this was a big deal. Then, this is already 26 years ago. So wow. this isn't something that just came with us. Yeah. Perry debates resigning. And then he says, I decided not to resign. And then now I don't know. I've thought about it for the last 20 years. Should I have resigned at that point? And what's also striking is that our senior statesman, who I appreciate more and more as I get older and know more and have seen more, George Kennan, mm -hmm. who was the author of the containment policy in 1947 against the Soviet Union, but always meant it to be a non-military kind of containment and always emphasized there's, a, there's an off-ramp to the Cold War. And he bemoaned the whole Cold War approach of a, of a thermonuclear arms race. He thought this was madness. When Clinton went ahead with the NATO enlargement, Kennan immediately said, this is the start of the new Cold War. Striking. Mm. The, the, the person, I think, most sensitive to Russian history in the 20th century. And he knew immediately that we were on a new path of confrontation because he understood the U.S. government and he understood the Russian government. And he called it, that was in 1997, I believe, that he stated that, so 25 years ago. So the whole narrative right now is that this came out of nowhere. Right. And if you say NATO enlargement, like you say, you're, you're mocked, you're laughed at, you're called a Putin apologist, you're put on uh, some Ukraine list as a, a <laughs> as propagator <we> <laughs> of propaganda and so on. And, you know, the, the truth is, we don't hear the truth about a lot of things these days. No. Uh, because we are a security state where everything is, uh, is, is confidential, everything is hidden from the public, uh, all these decisions that we're talking about, the life and death decisions of the planet are being made by a handful of people, a handful of people. That's the real situation of American political system. That is not the democracy we talk about of deliberation and congressional hearings. And, and we don't have champions like we had in the past. Where's a, a J. William Fulbright uh, who talked about the arrogance of power and who warned against the Vietnam War and people that I knew growing up who were able to stand against uh, this uh, monolithic militaristic viewpoint, but we don't have that right now. So it's extraordinarily dangerous. Well, what is your message to people, to the American people and, and people of the world right now in uh, who are hearing this, who are understanding the gravity 
of of this crisis that we're facing, where literally as we sit here, maybe tomorrow, maybe in a week, maybe in a month, we could be in a situation where World War III is sparked, uh, where a nuclear war has begun, and we are on the path towards destruction of this world as we know it, destruction of life as we know it. The 2024 election is a few years away still. So yes, it's, we have an election here in the United States coming up in a few weeks. It's important to vote. But what can we do right now? You know, I was uh, just on a call with a wonderful peace group in Brooklyn, New York, uh, and uh, they asked the question and I thought that one thing they could do immediately was uh, call the New York congressman and congresswomen and say, we want you online right now yeah. to talk to us. We don't want to hear from your staff. We don't want to hear we're too busy. This is life and death. And we want to speak to you. We don't just want to hear from you. We want to speak to you because it's your job also to keep us safe. And I would like people all over the country to call their congressmen and congresswomen and get them online with communities because we don't have to uh, just assume that somewhere far off in Washington, they're doing the right thing. We don't have to wait for them to uh, to, to run 100 miles to, to find them someplace. We can have the same kind of Zoom with them as we're having right now and demand that they do their job. They're not doing their job. And, and, and this that, is the biggest problem because in the U.S. Constitution, Congress declares war. Yeah. But we don't have a constitutional order. We have a security state. And the security state means that we are in the hands of a few people. And frankly, I don't trust their judgment right now. They've got a terrible, terrible track record. I know there's a lot of people uh, across the United States who are concerned for the well-being of the people of Ukraine. Uh, people who are putting Ukrainian flags out uh, in front of their homes and uh, who feel very compassionate towards the pain and the suffering that they're seeing play out on the television. A little less these days, but it was 24-7 when the invasion first began. Um, what what it, What is your message to them when we say, hey, tell our members of Congress, tell the president to do the right thing? Can you paint the picture of what that is for the American people who are trying to figure out what is the right thing to do uh, to, to do good. Yeah, we say uh, our government says we love Ukraine, but they're loving them to death. Literally. You know, putting, you, putting Ukraine in between NATO and Russia, it's going to be Ukraine that's going to, that's going to receive the first nuclear attack if there is one. Right. So we're not doing any favors to Ukraine right now. Yeah. We should be pushing both sides to negotiate for peace. And the idea of that this war is helping Ukraine, no. Uh, we're helping Ukraine the same way we helped Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In other words, we are leveling this country by our armaments, their armaments, our HIMARS, their missiles. This is not helping Ukraine. I absolutely want to help the Ukrainian people. I advised the Ukrainian government. I've been involved with Ukraine from the beginning. My message is not about pro-Russia or pro-Ukraine. It is about peace exactly. so that everybody can survive. And if you fly the flag for Ukraine, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that the way to protect Ukraine is NATO weaponry in an escalation to nuclear war. That's no protection at all. It's astonishing to me how the president of the United States and all of his emissaries in different ways continue to repeat the talking point over and over and over again. Well, this is Putin's war. You know, increasing gas prices are because of Putin's war. Uh, supply shortages are because of Putin's war. There's no when asked directly, hey, when does this war end? When do we kind of like, when do we cut things off? And Biden says, well, that's up to Putin, uh, putting everything on Putin's doorstep as though the United States of America is a powerless entity that is passive in all of this. I think the the leverage that the United States has, obviously because of the money and arms and everything that are pouring into Ukraine, uh, is is probably the most powerful in the world to push for peace. And it's not just leverage uh, 
about our leverage in Ukraine and so forth. This war is about the United States. So it's absolutely direct. At the beginning of the war, uh, Chancellor Schultz of Germany went to Putin and said, uh, you know, I guarantee NATO won't expand while I'm chancellor. And Putin laughed at him and said, yeah, how, how long are you going to be chancellor? Mm-hmm. He wants to talk to Biden. Right. Let's get real. This is a U.S. led alliance. And so this is about the United States. And we need to dominated by U.S. hegemony to a multipolar world where other governments, especially in the global south, are given more agency and, and more say in how the world is run. So lately, I've really kind of felt that the switch to a multipolar world has accelerated quite a bit, especially with the diplomatic gains China has made in the Middle East. So I was wondering if you believe that we're truly heading into a new multipolar paradigm. And I was also wondering what you think that might look like. Well, the world is changing, and it's changing very fast from uh, not just a unipolar world with the U.S. uh, role as a so-called hegemon, but really from a North Atlantic-led world of the last two centuries to uh, a world where economy, finance, power is much more spread around the world. The industrial era began in England. It's uh, uh, therefore no real surprise that England or Britain became the first uh, industrial global empire. Uh, And uh, Britain ruled the seas uh, and uh, really ruled much of the world during the 19th century. And other European newly industrialized countries uh, form their own empires in Africa and in Asia. And that Western-led or North Atlantic-led world continued throughout the 20th century. Uh, But after two disastrous world wars and a Great Depression, the uh, global leadership of the North Atlantic shifted from Western Europe and Britain Uh, to the United States. So the U.S. has been the dominant power since 1945. But with independence uh, of India, the end of empire across Africa, the uh, restoration of real sovereignty uh, of China, starting with the formation of the People's Republic in 1949, and with the economics that has followed that, The world economy has rebalanced. The spread of technology has become uh, far more equal. China, of course, has become one of the lead economies and centers of innovation of the world. India is one of the fastest growing uh, large economies of the world. The world's changing. And for me, a, a notable point is that the BRICS countries... Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, uh, now when measured at so-called international prices, have larger output than the G7 countries, than the United States, Canada, Britain, France, Italy, Germany, and Japan. So that's a notable change. All of this means we're moving to a multipolar world. None of it means that the United States likes it or accepts it right now. So psychologically, Uh, The U.S. is uh, having a very hard time and it's trying to hold on to its dominance, but that's just not possible uh, in a world of uh, diverse uh, talents, skills, innovation, economy, when the U.S. is just 4% of the world population. Yeah, I get the feeling that a lot of people, especially in the West, um, have this idea that they might suffer under a multipolar order. Um, so you, do you think that fear is warranted or can the US and the collective West uh, continue to succeed in a more multipolar world? You know, as an economist, uh, I'm uh, a believer in a win-win world. Uh, I don't believe that globalization or the rise of China or the rise of India or the rise of Africa in any way diminishes the uh, opportunities for well-being in the United States or Europe. Indeed, I think it enhances those possibilities. In any event, we need cooperation to face challenges like human-induced climate change. So, 
for all of those reasons, I believe in a uh, win-win world where uh, gains from uh, trade and uh, advances in economy from technological advances can and should spread around the world. If you are a you know, military strategist or a geopolitical strategist, uh, it seems uh, that the uh, feeling is quite different, that the gain of the other is somehow a loss for you. Uh, and so I know that uh, international relations realists sometimes think that China's rise is detrimental to the United States. It's a different mindset. I think it's a dangerous mindset, actually, to think in that way because it almost inevitably leads to confrontation and the real chance of deadly conflict. And so I want to emphasize the win-win nature of the world economy. Uh, it's not one region's gain necessarily at the expense of the other. Everybody can benefit from the advancement of know-how and technology and scientific understanding. I'm really crossing my fingers. Uh, I, I too am really pushing for a win-win kind of situation. Now, the US and China um, have gone through obviously a really rough patch in terms of relations uh, of late with uh, Nancy Pelosi's provocative trip to Taiwan last year, to Balloon Gate, uh, to these allegations of widespread genocide against the Muslim minorities in Xinjiang, to calls for war by 2025, uh, to the Select Committee on so-called competition with the CPC. And of course, lately, uh, we also have a TikTok and the mainstream media's kind of feverish obsession with Yellow Peril 2.0 kind of painting China as this um, dark, dangerous, dirty dystopia. Why is it, um, do you think, that the US is seemingly uh, so obsessed with uh, tearing China down at the present moment? And what do you think it would take for those relations to improve? I think uh, almost all of this is the result of China's success. Uh, the United States uh, strategists and politicians didn't want a, a, a peer or a, a rival competitor. And then China showed up on the scenes as a large, successful economy that for 40 years plus since 1980 has been one of the most dynamic parts of the world economy and now at the cutting edge of many leading technologies. And I think the United States uh, political class resents this, uh, is fearful of it. The geostrategists who think in terms of uh, zero-sum uh, struggles think that China's advances to the detriment of the United States. Again, a mindset I don't believe and don't uh, accept and think is uh, actually a very dangerous one. But most of this is a, a reaction to China's success. And I think that it needs to be overcome through systematic dialogue, negotiation, hammering out uh, solutions where there are real differences, not the shouting, the finger pointing, uh, the kind of uh, hysteria. Of course, uh, there's a lot of prejudice built in as well. You mentioned Yellow Peril 2.0. Well, there is some feeling wrong in the United States, that if China has advanced, they must have cheated to do it. How could they be a competitor with us, after all? Uh, this is uh, pretty ingrained uh, and uh, is wrong. I say to these people, get a passport, go take a visit, go learn something, read some history, understand uh, the long sweep of history. I wrote a book in uh, 2020 called The Ages of Globalization, in which China features for hundreds and hundreds of years as the world leading uh, economy, uh, the source of major technological advances. Uh, I explain uh, the swings that happened afterwards, but I see China's recovering a natural position as one of uh, the world leaders in innovation and technology. And from my point of view, that's all to the good. Uh, but this is not the mindset right now. And I think we have to work hard so that the mindset of fear 
uh, and zero sum thinking doesn't overwhelm us and doesn't lead to open conflict, which it could. Mm. Now, speaking of um, having a passport and getting around, um, you've been to a few places. You've given um, economic advice to a number of governments, including those of Mikhail Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin. And in Poland, um, you were awarded one of that country's highest honours, the Order of Merit, for authorising a comprehensive plan to switch from a central planned model to the market economy. So I was wondering, based on your vast experience in that area, um, how you would summarise China's reform and opening up over the past uh, 40 odd years. And do you agree um, with the idea that um, this country's witnessed kind of an economic miracle that's without precedent? China has been the most successful, sustained 40 year uh, economic development and uh, growth uh, of any large economy in history. Uh, what's happened in the period since 1980 is extraordinary and extraordinarily positive. China went from uh, being a society uh, with most people living in poverty. Uh, the numbers depend on definitions, but 60% poor, some estimate 80% poor, to ending poverty in its extreme form by 2020. Well, that's a phenomenal achievement. Uh, and uh, it reflects uh, a uh, mixed economic system, both market and state, uh, private and public, uh, a tremendous capacity to plan uh, at uh, the National Development and Reform Commission, among other institutions, the uh, tremendous capacity to build infrastructure uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers of fast intercity rail, of uh, roads, of a power uh, system, and so forth, on a, on a massive scale. Uh, and the Chinese economy uh, lives on, on that uh, physical infrastructure that connects uh, the entire country. I've been watching this process closely since my first visit to China 42 years ago. So I came in 1981. China was very poor then. This was very clear uh, just by uh, looking uh, at uh, life as one would see it uh, on the streets uh, or in the shops. Uh, I've been visiting China frequently uh, ever since 1981. And what has happened is, is absolutely extraordinary, uh, hugely beneficial for China and beneficial for, for the whole world. Mm. So, so do you think then that China has achieved anything specifically um, in their poverty alleviation process that maybe other states um, might be able to emulate? Well, I, I say to my friends uh, and governments in Africa that look at what China did over a 40 year period. Uh, Africa uses the date, interestingly, of 2063 as its reference point because 2063 will be the 100th anniversary of African unity and the foundation of the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, which is the precursor of the African Union. So they look to 2063. Here we are in 2023. Okay, 40 years. Think of China, 1980 to 2020. Think of Africa, 2023 to 2063. Uh, China provides an inspiration and in many important ways, a kind of roadmap. Uh, invest heavily, build infrastructure, uh, get the kids in school, make the quality education, make the real investments that build the capacity of the economy. It's not gimmickry uh, that uh, brought China to its uh, current uh, prosperity. It is heavy investments, large scale, over a long period with good planning, uh, good public administration, uh, and uh, educating uh, generations of uh, Chinese young people uh, in uh, skills, uh, in scientific capacity, and so on. So I think there's a, a lot that is a roadmap for other regions. Mm, interesting. Now, to switch gears just a little bit, although kind of related, um, inflation has been a massive problem recently, uh, but China's inflation rate is currently sitting at 1%, uh, while the US is around 6 and the UK is about 10.4%, I think. Um, in layman's terms, how is it that China is able to keep inflation so low, and, and do you think that rate will last? Well, the inflation that uh, is... Um 
being experienced in the U.S. and Europe is the result of uh, dislocations that came from COVID and from the Ukraine war and from the sanctions that were imposed by the U.S. and Europe uh, in the wake of the war and from the policy choices that were made in response to these shocks, uh, especially in the year 2020, when the pandemic broke out, the central banks of the United States and Europe issued a lot of credit, a massive expansion of the money supply. And that turned into inflation by 2022. And the disruptions of the global supply chains, first from COVID itself, but then from the war and the geopolitical tensions with China and the sanctions regimes, when combined with the money expansion, boosted the inflation. China didn't do the same thing. China didn't make this massive monetary expansion in 2020 the way the Federal Reserve did. Uh, and China is not experiencing the same disruptions uh, that uh, came from the sanctions regimes, which have been some sense boomeranged on the sanctioning countries uh, because it's disrupted their own supply chains. So uh, I think this is partly the result of shocks and partly the result of policy choices and I'd say some policy mistakes that were made in the West. There's no reason why this phenomenon has to be uh, a global phenomenon in, in the same way. Mm. Now, I kind of want to flip about 180 degrees. Um, what do you think happened with Nord Stream? Well, Nord Stream was a, um, a project that the United States opposed from its inception. Uh, Nord Stream is the gas pipeline from Russia to Western Europe. And the United States uh, said from the very start that Europe should not buy gas from Russia. I disagree with that analysis, but the U.S. said, well, that will make Europe dependent on Russia. To my mind, it's not a matter of dependency. It's a matter of economics and trade. Russia has a lot of inexpensive gas. Uh, Europe has a great uh, manufacturing capacity. Buying that gas is uh, good for Europe's uh, competitiveness and for production. Uh, and uh, that's where the pipeline idea came from. But the U.S. hated the pipeline. Uh, the U.S. said, well, this uh, makes uh, Europe follow uh, uh, Russia's uh, uh, geopolitics and so forth. I, I think that this was uh, not the right approach. But it all leads me to believe that the most likely scenario of Nord Stream is the U.S. blew it up. Uh, because uh, the U.S. hated the project, the U.S. warned that in the event of a Russian invasion, uh, the pipeline would end. President Biden himself said that uh, on tape on February 7th, 2022. And when the reporter asked, but Mr. President, that's an international project. How can you say it will end? He said, believe me, we have our ways. Well, I think we probably saw those ways with the destruction of the pipeline. It's not proved. Uh, the story that the investigative uh, journalist Seymour Hirsch uh, has put out is very credible, and it has not been knocked down in any s substantive way. And I uh, had the opportunity to speak to the members of the UN Security Council and strongly urged an independent UN-led investigation. Let's get to the bottom of it. Countries know more than they're telling. That we need to investigate. Well, China and Russia and Brazil said, yes, let's investigate. The United States said, no. Uh, well, why do you say no? Uh, we need to find out. So I, I continue to urge uh, the UN to investigate this because we need security of international infrastructure. And when a major pipeline is blown up, it's actually a, a global threat to the peace. What do you think are the chances of the UN um, undertaking an investigation? Well, I hope more and more countries uh, support the idea of an independent investigation because there are many facts that are 
need to be known. And because if we're going to succeed in fighting climate change, for example, we're going to need a lot of international infrastructure. We want it to be secure. We don't want it to be blown up. So when there is a major piece of infrastructure blown up, I say it's a threat to the peace in the sense that we need fiber, uh, we need uh, pipelines, uh, we need power grids in submarine cables uh, to make our world economy function properly. So we need security of the international infrastructure. Do you think TikTok will be blocked in the U.S.? Uh, we're in a kind of... To a changing way of global shared responsibilities. So I'm here because of how important it is that uh, India is president of the G20 and proposing exactly this rebalancing of the international governance system. We have the technologies especially <laughs> digital technologies that can enable countries that were lagging in economic development to make huge progress. And India, of course, is the case in point now. It's the fastest growing large economy in the world. There is a tremendous uptake of digital infrastructure, uh, hundreds of millions of people uh, coming into uh, broadband services. And of course, the entire population uh, online in some sense with digital identity and uh, with the digital public services. To my mind, this is very good for India's development. Um, and it enables India's current growth of about 7% per year, uh, which is very good uh, and could accelerate, in fact. We need this kind of pattern in general throughout the developing world. Africa is a good case in point. It's about the same population as India, but it's divided into 55 countries rather than uh, one country. Uh, that's because uh, the, uh, there were many colonial powers in, in Africa. Uh, they carved up the continent, uh, and therefore when independence came, it was uh, dozens of independent countries, all of which were too small to achieve development at scale. Finally, the African Union is really creating a union. And one point that I've made is first that the African Union should become the 21st member of the G20 uh, as a permanent member. Second, uh, what India is learning about deploying large scale digital on a very rapid basis, I think can be uh, a roadmap for Africa as well, and also for strong India-Africa diplomacy and, uh, and, a, and a trade. Well, remember, we have many shocks right now, so this uh, is a, a very unsettling time. We have uh, COVID. We have uh, the financial uh, tightening and even crisis. We have the uh, sanctions regime against Russia. We have the Russia-Ukraine war, and we have the uh, U.S.-China tensions. It's too many uh, it, <laughs> because on top of all of that are the long-term deep crises of climate change, environmental degradation, and so on. We need to solve some of these uh, intense geopolitical crises quickly before they overwhelm us in uh, financial, economic, and even military terms. Right now, the system is not operating properly. It's, of course, overwhelmed by the crises, uh, so it's not delivering and even when the countries come to the IMF, uh, while the IMF helps them, the fact that they're there means it's already too late. It's already being in the emergency room rather than prevention. One of the goals of the G20 needs to be uh, a new financial architecture 
that is providing a lot more capital to developing countries so that they don't end up in the IMF emergency room. India is achieving huge progress. What we didn't know uh, in 1998 was how the digital revolution would support that whole agenda. Uh, because now with uh, universal, or it's not quite universal, but near universal uh, uh, access to uh, online ID and to bank accounts and to public services, now the rural areas, which were really rural and left behind, uh, can uh, absolutely be fully connected. Um, India is uh, in the process of making significant strides in using digital for healthcare, for education, of course, for payments, for finance, for public services. Um, there's a lot of uh, innovation taking place, not only in Indian business operations, <laughs> but in science and technology across the country. So I have to feel uh, quite uh, good about uh, the optimism uh, from 25 years ago uh, and think that India is realizing this potential. Well, even as important as U.S.-China dialogue is India-China dialogue. Uh, India and China have uh, both a lot to work out, um, but also incredible gains uh, through cooperation, uh, if cooperation is achieved. China should absolutely uh, seek out India as a partner in building the multipolar world. Uh, India and China went through a similar history, of course. Looking back in 1800, both were major economies, not only uh, major civilizations. Uh, and in the 150 years between 1800 and 1950, both India and China suffered very, very badly. Now, since mid 20th century, both are becoming, again, major global powers and are working to create a multipolar world. There's a huge shared interest of India and China in the success of that transformation from a, a Western-led world to a world-led world, uh, to a true multipolar world. So India and China have a lot to cooperate on, and they do cooperate in the BRICS process uh, in uh, other venues, but these, uh, this border conflict, for example, uh, uh, that China instigated is a mistake. Uh, India and China should say that is the least of our concerns right now. We will have peace uh, on uh, our borders. We will not have these skirmishes. We will not have these tensions. And we have huge common interests in sustainable development, in multilateralism, in a multipolar world. So that's where I would hope the dialogue would go. Uh, close India-China relations. I have argued that this war resulted in part from the uh, idea that NATO would enlarge to Russia's border. Uh, and I thought that proposal was a terrible mistake when it first was made in 2008. And uh, the US and Europe have continued to push that idea even after President Putin said, that is a red line for us. We will not and cannot accept NATO on our Ukraine border, uh, so you have to stop. 
And I think that uh, Russia is correct about that. Uh, prudence would say, don't keep pushing this issue. It will create a wider war. I think that point of view is widely understood uh, outside of uh, the Western world. Uh, India, China, Brazil, uh, South Africa uh, are all saying this war should end through negotiation. Uh, this war should respect Russia's security interests as well as Ukraine's security interests. This, to my mind, is absolutely the way to end this war. And I believe that if China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, and other uh, countries uh, around the G20 table say clearly, peace. We need peace. We need a negotiated end. That message can be heard. It's the right message. It's fair. Uh, it is uh, practical. It is implementable. Uh, it's uh, safe for the world. So to my mind, this is a real opportunity uh, of uh, major countries to say to both sides, sit down and resolve this thing uh, in a mutually satisfactory way. Stop escalating. It's not, not the popular uh, position in the United States. Most people don't have uh, the experience that I have of having been involved in these issues for 30 years firsthand. So I was an advisor to President Gorbachev. I was an advisor to President Yeltsin. I was an advisor to President Kuchma of Ukraine. I was an advisor to President Yushchenko of Ukraine. I've been involved in this all along. I want all sides of this to succeed. I don't want enemies of one side or another. I really don't like the idea of banishing Russia. Uh, my whole idea of, uh, as an advisor more than 30 years ago was help Russia to become a normal uh, cooperative uh, uh, partner in development. That was Gorbachev's idea, and I was quite inspired by that then, and I still think it's the right idea. So I say these things, then people push back, no, that's not true. But the fact of the matter is I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, others may read what they do in the U.S. press, but I have the firsthand experience. Rich countries uh, have uh, three kinds of responsibilities. First, for historical emissions. The climate today is deranged and degraded because of the rich countries in the past. So that's a historical responsibility. Then there is an ongoing responsibility. The rich countries emit far more greenhouse gases per capita than the poor countries. This is a current issue, and the United States is still emitting 15 tons of carbon dioxide per person. Uh, and in India, it's uh, below two tons per capita, if I uh, remember the most recent uh, data correctly. Um, and so this is a huge, huge uh, gap. And that's a general truth that the rich countries still are the major emitters, but even within the rich, there's a difference of Europe and the United States. The U U.S. is really a heavy emitter, uh, so that's a second uh, responsibility. The third responsibility is uh, financial, uh, and that is that the current economic system favors the rich over the poor. Uh, the rich pay low interest costs when they borrow, the poor pay sky-high usury uh, costs. Uh, and uh, the rich have a responsibility to rectify the situation so that finance works for everybody. That's what the G20 central mission should be. Uh, so in this sense, uh, if you ask, are the rich doing enough? Not 
by a, a very long distance. They're not respecting their historical responsibility. They're not respecting their current responsibility, and they're not solving the financial crisis. All of those should be part of a, a solution. Well, Indi India's role is basically to develop in a smart way. Uh, so India is building out electrification. There's a lot more to come. India is going to need a lot more power in the future, but it should be clean power. By the way, that's vital for India for uh, even the most direct reason that the air pollution in this country, uh, especially in the north, is so bad uh, that uh, even if it weren't climate, the need to clean up the pollution is uh, extremely um, urgent. So that's one reason. Second, of course, this country gets very hot uh, in the springtime. Uh, and uh, we're seeing uh, temperatures of 50 degrees C being reached. We're seeing mega heat waves. We're seeing drought conditions. India is really threatened uh, by uh, global forces. And so India absolutely needs to be in the forefront of saying to all of the countries, you have to do this together. We will do this together with you. India has proposed a massive transformation of the Indian economy, but it has also said, where's the finance? Uh, why are we paying 7 or 8% interest rates, whereas you, uh, the U.S. and Europe, are paying 2 or 3% interest rates? Come on. Uh, we, we will do our part, but we need a system that works. So these are the issues at the center of the G20 agenda. This is a definitely a business directed government in that it thinks at scale. Uh, so uh, this government says we're going to electrify every village in the country. Uh, this government says we're going to ensure digital access for everybody. Uh, this government uh, um, thinks in terms of solutions at the scale of 1.4 billion people. And that's what I meant by a business like government that uh, is thinking at scale, planning at scale, and it's happening. We're closer to that today than in 2005 in that China, a country the same size as India's population, 1.4 billion, went from pervasive extreme poverty to ending poverty. So China did that. India is on a path to doing it right now. Africa lags behind by uh, quite a distance and needs to leapfrog now. India can help Africa to do that. Uh, with the especially massive deployment of digital technologies for healthcare, for education, for uh, basic e economics. We're in worse situation than in 2005 on the environment because uh, we've had uh, 18 years of much too little action. So the environmental crisis is a much deeper crisis now than even two decades ago. Why didn't we end poverty by 2025? Because uh, the effort was not made. Uh, the certain processes worked in the right direction, certain countries that worked in the right direction, but uh, in the United States, we were absolutely distracted by too many wars, uh, too much geopolitics, not enough practical attention to solutions. And at the global level, uh, we really left behind some of the poorest people in the world. Um, so what could have been done wasn't done. On the other hand, the goal of ending extreme poverty now is not just in my book in 2005, it was 
taken up by the whole world in 2015. It's SDG number one, the first sustainable development goal and extreme poverty. So at least we have it on the global agenda. Clearly, we even have a time.